In common with many astronauts, Russell Schweikart only flew into space once. But arguably, Apollo 9 was one of the most important missions of the whole Apollo project, being the first test of the complete Apollo system, including the lunar module and the lunar EVA suit and backpack. Both the build-up to the mission and the mission itself were beset with problems. But meeting President John F. Kennedy's challenge to place a man on the moon by the end of the 1960s depended on the complete success of the Apollo 9 mission. Well, of course, ever since I was a kid, I was interested in space. Uh, you know, astronomy, when I was a kid, there were obviously no space missions. So, um, but I had always been interested in astronomy and the sky. And uh, so when I think I was in high school and the Collier's Magazine series first came out on exploring space, you know, with Chesley Bonisil's paintings and uh, Werner von Braun and Heinz Haber and Willy Ley and uh, all sorts of people. Uh, I mean, that was, that was terribly exciting for me as a kid because here were people who were literally talking about going out into space. And uh, so it was all very exciting. And I can still remember, you know, seeing, uh, say, monthly or several times a year, uh, the next V2 would go up from White Sands and, you know, it would go higher than the one before and did it, it is, the big deal was, uh, you know, have we gotten a picture of the curved horizon yet, you know. It was an early interest in mine which then ended up translating into my studying aeronautics and astronautics at MIT and going into the Air Force and becoming a fighter pilot, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course then, um, you know, literally while I was in the Air Force as a fighter pilot, uh, the, first, uh, the first missions went up, Sputnik flew, and, uh, uh, and then lo and behold, the, uh, y you know, we selected the first astronauts, and I remember, uh, you know, there I was now, a, a, f a fighter pilot with a good bit of experience, and so it was... Um, you know, rather logical that uh, here were a group of people that were going higher and faster than I was, so I wanted to be one of them. <laughs> From the Air Force, I went back to graduate school at MIT, and uh, in 1963, I applied for the astronaut uh, group that was being selected then. That was the third group of astronauts. When you join the astronaut office, and it may still be true today, actually, I don't even know, but uh, at the, in those days when you became an astronaut, uh, you know, there were a number of different things that you had to do. You had to go through a sort of basic um, uh, training which, which brought everyone to a kind of common level because people would come in with different kinds of backgrounds. Some had much more education than others. Others had much more flying experience than, than some of the others. So there was a sort of um, leveling process that went on, which was a combination of academics and flying, uh, the, the great survival training things, you know, jungle survival and water survival, etc. because nobody knew where you might come down. So you <laughs> wanted you to survive no matter what happened. But that process was, that was one thing that happened. But in addition to that, then each of us picked up areas of responsibility that related to uh, either getting the equipment ready for flight or getting the pilot input to different things. So one person would, for example, pay attention to the spacesuits and the development of the spacesuits and testing and that sort of thing. Someone else would be the uh, the crew displays uh, in the spacecraft, you know, the switches and dials and, you know, the crew interface kind of thing. Um, I happen to be, uh, well, from different, different times, different things, but in the early Gemini years, I was responsible for the crew input and interface with the experiments that we had, which were very few on, on Gemini, but we had a few. And um, then later in Apollo, I became uh, responsible for the guidance and navigation uh, interface with the crew and all of the software that enabled us to land on the moon and that, that sort of thing. Uh, so there were a number of different responsibilities of that kind that you had a kind of an engineering oversight uh, uh, crew systems responsibility. And then, of course, once you were assigned to a mission, 
then uh, as either prime or backup crew. Then those things went by the way and your focus was entirely on preparing for that mission, training for it, developing all of the procedures and that sort of thing. Excellent. So can you just talk to me a bit about the build up to the Apollo 9 flight because there were lots of delays and lots of problems. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> Understatement. Uh, you know, to, uh, to be honest with you, there were so many changes in the program at that point because of many different things, including the Apollo fire, of course. But there were so many changes that went on that, that our crew bounced around from here, there, the other place. We, we at one point or another, were assigned uh, the first three lunar modules and the first three or four command and service modules that came off the line, but they would bounce all around. First we'd have this one, then we'd have that one, then that would be pulled off, and that was going to go out around the moon, but without a LEM, and then our LEM uh, development at Grumman was very slow and turbulent and we finally said look we can't fly this thing this is really not a flyable spacecraft why don't we fly the next one down the line which is in much better shape so the program then shifted again and so there was a lot of shifting and changing and adjusting in the program and uh, to be perfectly honest with you it happens so frequently that I cannot put that history together. It's just not something, you know, as for historians. Apollo 9 was the first uh, flight of the lunar module. And um, so the real focus was on really two things. The, the lunar module per se, as much of it as we could test around the local planet. We didn't go out to the moon, we stayed in Earth orbit. So that essentially that meant we could test everything except those things which enabled you to land on the moon. So the landing radar, the uh, descent uh, prop part of the, uh, of the mission for, uh, on landing on the moon, we could not test in, in Earth orbit. But everything else we could, all of the systems of the lunar module, the rendezvous process, the rendezvous radar, the procedures, uh, etc. All of that was a prime uh, set of, of mission objectives. But then in addition to that, um, I was the lunar module pilot and one of the other things that w we needed to test was the Apollo suits. The Apollo suit was different, significantly different from the Gemini suit, which had given us a lot of problems, EVA. Um, the Gemini suit did not have convolution, convolutes at the at the joints and therefore uh, movement in the suit was r a real effort. Whereas in the Apollo suit, um, uh, it was a constant volume suit so that we, as you moved, you didn't uh, fight against the suit so much. And, um, uh, but more important than the suit per se was the backpack, which obviously running around on the moon, you can't have an umbilical that you're dragging all around. So we had to have an autonomous uh, uh, portable life support system. And uh, so on Apollo 9, one of the primary objectives, uh, aside from testing the LEM, was for me to go outside with the suit and a portable life support system and, and give that an initial checkout and uh, get it ready for the, uh, or verify that it was ready for lunar missions. So that was another, you know, high point of, of the mission, frankly. The Apollo 9 mission began on the 3rd of March, 1969. The crew of Commander James McDivitt, Command Module Pilot David Scott and Lunar Module Pilot Swicart had an intensive programme of tests to conduct during their 10-day mission, including the first transposition and docking of the Lunar Module from the Saturn V third stage, undocking and redocking the Lunar Module and Command Module, testing the Lunar Module's propulsion system and the crucial first test of the Apollo spacesuit and backpack. But this key element of the mission was placed in jeopardy when, on the third day, Schweikart was badly affected by what has since become known as Space Adaptation Syndrome, or more commonly, space sickness. First of all, you know, motion sickness in, in space or anywhere else is, is quite literally something that we don't understand. Uh, Certainly no one got overtly ill, no one, no one barfed uh, on, on Gemini. But we do know that the Russians had some, a few problems early on. 
we did not know at all why they had problems. We didn't have problems. Then when we got to Apollo, um, there were no problems on the first mission. Um, the second mission, going to the moon and out, out around the moon, you know, on Apollo 8, uh, Frank Borman got sick. Ostensibly, that's the first time that anyone got sick in the American program. Now, afterward, in retrospect, I suspect that that's not literally true. That is, it may be it, it's literally true in the sense that Frank was the first person who barfed. Uh, but I suspect that other people had been feeling queasy and didn't say anything about it, you know. Uh, those were macho times, you know, the right stuff and all of that, you know, and uh, you're dealing with a bunch of fighter pilots and test pilots and, you know, real men don't get sick, you know, that's a lot of crap, but that was the, the sense, you know. And so Frank was, uh, you know, typical of that, frankly, and frankly, right, and he uh, declined to take any tests after the flight and blamed it on second all, you know, that that was, he had an allergic reaction or something to second all, and refused to take any tests after the flight. And so I was certainly aware coming up on Apollo 9 that um, I was somewhat susceptible to motion sickness, uh, you know, in, in uh, uh, if, if I would go out in a small boat in, in, in the ocean, you know, I was a little more susceptible than many other people I knew. Um, so, you know, there was certainly that, that a possibility. And the, there was also an understanding that it dealt with head motions. That is, that motion of, of the head would tend to stimulate or aggravate it. So again, without any further information from Frank or without any testing or anything else, my sense was if I avoided um, rapid head mo movements in the early part of the flight, I would adapt uh, and be fine by the time, let's say on the third day, when, I, when my real work began on, on, on the mission. That was when the intense work of the lunar module pilot began on, on, on our flight. So, so the first couple of days, while Dave and, and, and uh, Jim were, you know, moving around doing their thing, I was doing my thing, but I was basically maintaining my head fairly steady, uh, you know, with the idea that I would then be adapting. Well, subsequently we learned, we learned that's a dumb thing to do, and we would have learned it if Frank had done a little bit of testing, but he didn't. So, I mean, what... What you do, by the way, when you j simply sit there and don't move your head is you, you postpone adaptation. You don't adapt by doing nothing. You postpone your adaptation, which means that when I had to be active, that's when it, it occurred, you know. That was when the biggest challenge came. And on the beginning of the third day of the flight, when, we were, when I was going to go over and activate the lunar module for the first time, uh, putting the suit on, which is a bit of a mess. Uh, you know, you really have to duck down inside the suit and it's, it, it's really a, a challenge to do it. Um, a vestibular challenge in particular in, in weightlessness. Uh, you know, I came up through the neck ring and in, in the suit, but I was pretty pale and not feeling very good. And uh, so then early on that third day, uh, you know, I grabbed the barf bag and, and let it go. Um, and like motion sickness anywhere, which many people experience, you know, you always feel much better right after you do it. Uh, um, and then we continued on, and I went through the lunar module and, you know, the activation period, and, you know, it was challenging. I mean, I could definitely feel malaise. The day progressed uh, when we were checking out the lunar module, and in uh, mid-afternoon sort of time frame, um, McDivitts over there also were, were each independently doing our checklists and turning things on and checking them out and making measurements, et cetera, et cetera. And at one point in the checklist, um, uh, the two of us had to work together on something. And I was a little, I arrived at that point a little ahead of Jim. Uh, he still had uh, five minutes uh, to do before he got to that point in the checklist when we could work together. And so uh, 
uh, I said, okay, Jim, let me know when you get there. And, um, you know, I just sort of took it easy. I just looked out the window, you know, I'm, I'm starting to look around. And that relaxation from the kind of intense following the checklist, you know, and working away, that phenomena of relaxation, suddenly, again, I was sick. And it was surprising to me, to everybody. I mean, it, it just sort of suddenly came up. It was not something that came up gradually. And, you know, so that was that second time that I got sick that day was really uh, sobering. Uh, in the sense that uh, it, it occurred suddenly, there was no real build-up or warning, and so what's going through your head, of course, is, well, you know, the next day is an EVA. You go, I mean, the, the, the straightforward way to say it is, if you're buttoned up in a suit outside and you barf, you die. I mean, that's it. Barf equals dead, right? Because you can't get at it. It's just going to hang there. You're going to suffocate. So it's nothing to fool with. And, you know, we're all very aware, aware of that. And so at the end of that day, you know, we're all saying, okay, what do we do? And, again, without any experience or tests or anything of that kind, we had no idea of the, the process or the time required for adaptation or all of that. That was all sort of there we were on our own. And so, uh, you, you know, Prudence said, we're going to have to cancel the EVA. Uh, you know, and, and not only did it make sense to cancel the EVA the next day, uh, but beyond that, there was a question in my mind, I don't think we ever really talked about it among ourselves right then, but certainly in my mind, and I have no doubt in, in Jim's mind and Dave's mind, there was a question, can we continue the flight? I mean, is this going to get worse? Is this getting better? Is it, you know, what's happening here? There was no way to project into the future. So that evening, of course, you know, we're all going off to, to sleep and, you know, going to sleep within your mind, you know, we've canceled the EVA. Do we or don't we have to cancel a flight? You cancel a flight, do we, you know, uh, ha have, have we screwed up, have I screwed up here to the point where, in a sense, because of this situation, we don't make President Kennedy's goal of getting to, to the moon and back by the end of the decade. I mean, it's like, whoa, man, that's a millstone around your neck, right? So, I mean, it wasn't exactly easy getting to sleep that night. So the next morning we wake up and, uh, you know, what we had decided, of course, I mean, logically what you do is you want to get the maximum out of it. So the idea was we were going to go all the way through to the point where we would actually depressurize the spacecraft um, and we would stop at that point in the checklist, assume that we went out and came back in with the EVA and pick up the checklist and go through the rest of it so that we work through all of the things that we could work through. Um, so that's what we're doing and, uh, on, on that fourth day, and, and McDivitt and I are over in the lunar module as if we're going, you know, right through with the EVA, but with the idea of stopping at that point. And we got about a half an hour to the point where we would depressurize the spacecraft, and, you know, I'm obviously feeling much better. And... Uh, so we had a moment, I don't remember what it was, but we, we had a moment where we didn't have to be doing something right away. And Jim looked at me and said, you know, you look like you're feeling better. And I said, yeah, I am. And he said, um, well, let's press on a bit and see, you know, see how it looks. And so we went on for, you know, the next half hour. And uh, Jim looks at me there and, and says, uh, you know, how are you feeling? And I said, I'm feeling pretty good. And uh, so he said, um, what do you think? I said, I think it's good. And he stood there and sort of nodded his head for a moment. And he picked up the microphone and he called Houston. He said, Houston, uh, we decided to go ahead with the EVA. And uh, so we just continued right down the checklist and did the EVA. But that, you know, I've often, I've often reflected back at that moment, not, not 
from my perspective, but from Jim McDivitt's perspective. And I thought that was the most tight and the best example of a command decision I think I've ever seen. I mean, we didn't debate it. You know, we knew each other very well. Nobody's playing a game. You know, you're talking life and death. And uh, Jim looked at me, I looked at him, and he said, let's do it. And, and, and that was it. We just let the ground know we're going. And so we went ahead with the EVA. So from, um, you know, from the night before, which was probably the low point in my life, to the next day, which is probably one of the high points in my, <laughs> in my life, if not the high point. Um, I mean, that's, that's an incredible uh, uh, psychological change. It was amazing. So, uh, you know, so it all turned out wonderfully. You know, we went and we got to the moon and back safely and all, you know, the, on at this end of the end of the story, right? In some ways, I know it's difficult for you. It's almost sort of a pivotal moment for the entire space program because suddenly the whole space program is going to, have to admit, yeah, the first two or three days that people are in space, mm -hmm. you know. Well, but the, of course, uh, you know, at that point we had a data point of two, Frank Borman and me. Well, unlike Frank, after the flight, I, you know, I volunteered to be the motion sickness guinea pig. Now, let me tell you something, that was really unpleasant. I mean, I spent the next three months over at Pensacola Naval Air Station going through every rotating room and, you know, spinning chair and you name it. I mean, it was just, you know, no pun, sickening. Uh, I mean, it was, it was really, uh, and out of all that, I have to tell you, and, and this is from the victim point of view, but we didn't learn that much. Maybe there's a correlation with an intrinsic, people with an intrinsic sense of balance are more susceptible, interestingly. Uh, you know, I was above the norm in terms of being able to close my eyes and walk down a balance beam, okay? You know, when your eyes are open, you get a lot of cues of your internal, your, your, your innate sense of balance. But when you close your eyes, I mean, you don't get any of those visual cues. It's all the sensory uh, apparatus, the inner ear. And, and so we, we ran every kind of test. And, uh, and there was a, at least a weak correlation with having a, a higher than normal innate sense of balance making you perhaps more susceptible to motion sickness. But in terms of what to do about it or could you predict it ahead of time, not a chance. Uh, you know, so the medicines that we take, uh, even today, is, at least to my knowledge, and I'm not, you know, a medical doctor, but at least to my knowledge, you sort of, serendipity is as much a part of the process as any kind of science, I'll tell you. Um, but in any event, and, and now we know, uh, even though at that time we got all the way to Apollo 9 before we got to two people who had gotten sick. Now we know about 50% of people who go into space, you know, get, get sick, um, and, and you adapt. I don't think we've ever had anybody, I think the Russians have, uh, you know, again, you know better than I do, but I think we've not had a case where someone did not adapt. I think the Russians might have had one or two cases. Uh, so it's, it's a matter of adaptation, and there are better ways and worse ways to do it, and because of the testing I did, we did learn that the, the most rapid way that you can adapt is by stimulating the inner ear but maintaining it just below the level where you actually get overtly sick. Uh, and if you can sort of maintain yourself just below that threshold, then you adapt the most rapidly. And of course, in, on Apollo 9, not knowing that, I, I, I delayed adaptation as long as I could, which was about the worst thing we could have done. Thank you, Frank Borman. I'll never forgive that son of a guy. <laughs> I've got one on tape now. Ah, you know. <laughs> Show it to him. I don't Excellent. care. Well, I mean, the, the, the proof it is that, I mean, nothing gets, no, no sort of crucial um, mission goals get programmed within sort of about three days. Of the yeah, start of well, uh, yeah, yeah, smart, right? Yeah. <laughs> we didn't know that yeah. originally. No, exactly. Yeah. Well, and luckily, uh, luckily, it, you know, it, it didn't really, in the end, cost us anything, but it could have. After Apollo 9, um, again, because I, I went into this um, adaptation uh, testing phase to be guinea pig, uh, 
you know, the, the Apollo assignments went on of, of necessity, and I never did cycle back into the Apollo program. So then I cycled back in on Skylab, and I worked Skylab, and you know, there's a whole story there, but um, uh, you know, we'll leave that for another time. When Skylab uh, finished up, I was the commander of the backup crew on the, on the first Skylab mission. And after Skylab was completed, uh, you know, my next opportunity to really fly was going to be the uh, space shuttle. And it was going to be, you know, a good six or seven years before I had a chance to fly. And I just didn't want to sit in the astronaut office, you know, to, to do that, uh, to wait and do the same design reviews and all this stuff that I'd done for you know 10 years already. So I went up to NASA headquarters and uh, took a, an administrative position at NASA headquarters to broaden my, you know, my management experience and uh, understand what, uh, you know, what, what running a program was about instead of executing it, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, that experience was very interesting at NASA headquarters. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, you know, I, I ended up, uh, let me say, not um, seeing eye to eye with the administrator at that time. And um, so I had an opportunity through some uh, work I had done in moving out into the outside world of briefing the governor of California on uh, space activities and the, the use of space uh, activities outside of NASA, uh, outside of you know, for, for public good. And um, uh, I ended up going out and becoming uh, Governor Jerry Brown's science and technology advisor or assistant for science and technology. And uh, that was in the, um, in the late 70s. And uh, uh, right about that time, we ended up with the first oil crisis um, and then the second oil crisis, and when that occurred, the governor asked if I would take over the California Energy Commission as the chairman of, of the Energy Commission, which I did. And at that point, I severed from NASA because I became an officer of the state of California, and so I could not hold a, government, a federal position at the same time. So that was when I formally left NASA at that point in 1979. and. Um, so for five years, I was the uh, chairman or commissioner of uh, energy in the state of California. Uh, that was also the period when I, uh, through other activities, decided to form the Association of Space Explorers. And um, so I started working that idea uh, of astronauts and cosmonauts being able to get together and really uh, not incidentally at something of this kind, you know, an international conference, but rather have our own organization where we really could interact on a one-to-one -one basis, not in front of the cameras in some big show or something, but, you know, where we really got to know one another and could, could uh, exchange information. And so uh, we formed the Association of Space Explorers. Um, uh, that was uh, very rewarding. Um, that's our, our uh, membership pin for the Association of Space Explorers. It was designed by Alexei Leonov. Yeah, so that's Alexei's helmet. And every year at our annual Congress, we give a Golden Helmet Award, a Crystal Helmet Award, to uh, you know, some special person who's done a lot of good for the world. So in 1985, then, I finished my, uh, my tenure on the California Energy Commission. And, uh, and put a couple of years into the Association of Space Explorers to get it up and running uh, at that time and uh, sort of securely established. Um, and then I went, uh, I, I started uh, doing a lot of work uh, because of my travel back and forth uh, to the Soviet Union, then Russia, you know, in that transition period. Um, I started doing some, uh, excuse me, private industry uh, work in small satellites and um, headed up a couple of companies and, you know, got into the uh, uh, startup uh, business, uh, small satellites and in telecommunications. And I was CEO of, of three different companies, none of which worked. <laughs> and, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, retired in, uh, in 1999, I guess, uh, 
from uh, my, my last stint as CEO of a, of a telecommunications company. But uh, it's been a very interesting uh, process and, um, you know, life has been fun. And since then, in fact, after I retired, then I started working on, uh, you know, near-Earth objects and protecting the Earth from asteroid impacts. But that's another story that takes a lot of time.